Boom! Here's some of your favorite quotes. Looks like your ordinary piece of crap from the outside, but whoever's behind the wheel is a demon. See, dub, this is why dub doesn't work as well as what, whatever. Getting caught by such a wee wack old clunker is the ultimate shame for a streetcar. Again, this is why sub is better than dub. And the anime was kind of brutal, but it was actually a really good anime for what it was. And there have been cars that have risen with fame and then died as people moved on to the next trend. This is like a thing. Hollywood can do that to a car and it makes me actually kind of sort of sad. But back in the day, like 40 years ago, there was a car that made like an epic establishment into the JDM world, a car that would become iconic in an anime, and car enthusiasts that grew up watching Thundercats and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fell in love with this little tiny boy. I'm Alex, Alex at FI on the socials, and today we're gonna be talking about a car that almost everyone will recognize when it's driving along, but no one seems to ever really pick them up because they realize how expensive it is. A car that is underwhelming on the outside, but fun in the driver's seat, you know what I'm saying? A car that likely founded the media's attention to the automotive scene from the JDM perspective here in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're gonna to be talking about the building block of a race car in the 80s. We're talking about you wanting to own a Toyota AE86, AKA the Hachi Roku. Also, welcome to Fitment. Industries, I'm Alex, don't forget to subscribe. And if you're just learning about us, we started making videos talking about this sort of stuff and oh, I was hoping, there was an H that was supposed to be at the beginning of that, that you'd add your modified car to our gallery to help people out that are looking to find wheels, tires, and suspension that fit their vehicle or didn't because it turns out we do make mistakes sometimes. So if you do have an aftermarket car, add it to our gallery, fitmentindustries.com forward slash add. And if you are looking for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension, be sure to check us out over at fitmentindustries.com where we literally have everything. Also, also, finish your goddamn car. All right, the season's almost here and it's 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 April. It's it's time to pick it up a nickel. The AE86 is a series of the Toyota Corolla 11 and Sprinter Trenio. I'm gonna get this wrong a couple times. But they were both extremely small front engine rear wheel drive models within the fifth gen Corolla, essentially built as a racing platform for the showroom stock, Group A and Rally and Club Racing. These cars were the backbone and foundation of motorsport racing and the first major car that had a build quality that catered to drifting, but we'll kind of get into that. The whole point of this car was that it was gonna be a affordable. Toyota has always done fun things with their name. And if you look back at the name Tueno or Levin, it literally stands for thunder in Spanish and lightning in Middle English. A little Easter egg for you. These two models are nearly identical, but this video is on the AE86 specifically. So buckle up buttercup, because we're going to talk about that one. The AE86 is an acronym for the engine series. The 4A is the engine. The E is for the Corolla for some reason. The 8 stands for the series of the E80 and 6 is the variant of this generation. The car itself wasn't too flashy, but it was enough. Fuel injected inline four with a 9.4 to 1 compression ratio, 130 horsepower in Japan and 112 in the North America due to the modified engine because of the EPA, five-speed manual gearbox, variable intake system, and an optional LSD. That was actually pretty damn good. Not only that, but Toyota threw some extra money at the car in places that made it a Lego for racing, such as ventilated disc brakes, McPherson-style strut independent suspension, four-link live axle, stabilizers bars, and dang near, dare I say, poke fitment from the factory. Right on you, Toyota. But they knew what they were doing because instead of designing like some clunky thing that was kind of a pain in the butt, they pretty much only built it to be a Lego block. They didn't really want to do anything outside of the norm that would make it unreliable. So an engineer by the name of Nobuaki Katayama pushed the AE6 project heavily. This would be the guy that would become the chief engineer for the first gen Lexus IS, was a former racing driver, led the Toyota Altezza project in Japan, and the first gen SC 400 and 300, and the fourth gen Toyota Supra, and finalized work within the Toyota World Rally Championship and the Le Mans program. I mean, he was... There are a million AE86 trim options, depending on which continent you're on, but for most of the time, you'll either see a GT, GT Apex, or a GTV trim. There's more, but those are the basics. During this time, both the Twenio and the Levin were sold with the classic pop-up headlights and Levin taillights. They just combined the pieces together, saves on cost. And if you wanted the lightest one out of the group, you're looking for the Japanese two-door GT model that came in at only 1,984 pounds. Huge. The A86 was an instant hit and it did it all right. It was a proper nimble sports car made by Toyota at a price that made sense and worked right into the amateur and professional automotive market. The lightest funk platform form was great for car races that would take on the likes of the Civics and the more expensive larger platforms. The cars were easily configured for rally use because of its weight and whooped serious buttocks at the time, all right? The 150 horsepower 886 would beat the actual 
ah, wait, what words? It would beat the BMW M6, the Mazda 929, the 190 2.3-16, and pretty much all the European Tour cars in the European Car Championship, which was a pretty monumental feat coming from a little tiny Toyota. It would be easy as hell to tune, become popular in Japanese street racing and two gay racing because of its weight. And if that wasn't enough, the Michael Jordan of racing at the time, Keichi Tuchia, gosh, this is hard. The Drift King popularized the car through the launch of the drifting culture and the racing culture. I mean, it was his, it was his thing. And it was in an anime. Besides the anime, it did a lot of other stuff. Okay. Nowadays, taking a look at the car that carries a bit of a Takumi tax has now become a classic here in the States and the want to own one by people like you and people like me have reached new heights, all right? Which is why we're done talking about the history of the AE86. Clock me, baby, is like seven minutes in. And the fact that it's now treated as a car plated in gold makes it a little bit hard to buy. No, we are here to talk about you wanting to own one of these tiny little hatchback cars that everyone seems to know, but not buy. So, you want to own an AE86. Well, set down your manga grab your favorite tofu because we're gonna sit down and talk about what it's like to actually own one of these things and if they're truly dare I say up to the JDM tax before you even jump into buying one there's a couple two tree things that you're gonna want to be aware of first one which one do you want because there's such a variety it's important to understand which one you're trying to track down and buy and there's lots of interest in the car but that usually translates to lots of people like top rank and others not really giving much merit to you if you don't know which version you're looking for especially even the model because you do have different models, Corolla GT Coupe. You have the Kuki, the Zenki, you have the Notchback or Hatchback. You have different trims, models, and options in different areas of the world. Chasing one down is a Rubik's Cube in and of itself. And if you don't understand really what you're gunning for, they're not really gonna figure it out for you. Now, once you find one, understand that you're likely paying 15 to $20,000 for a 40 year old now Toyota. Poop. You need to be picky or you're gonna be in trouble. Check your typical stuff. Here's some great things to keep in mind. Maintenance record, timing belts, run through the gears and see if any synchro mesh is worn, but get pickier, okay? You're gonna wanna check the spare tire area. Is there rust or is the spare even still there? Check the rear seats. If they go up and down without running into each other, that's usually a clear indication that they haven't been hit or slammed or anything in the back of the car. Now, if they do, it could have been in a collision. Now, remember, these cars are old, all right? And their life is likely not as well documented as you would have hoped. Check for rust. It's extremely common on these cars, but joint points and suspension mounts are easiest places to detect and check for rust. And this is gonna be really where you find a lot of that. Now, weld points are easy on the inside of the wheel wells to also check, and there are common places where rust can begin to rot the car. Remember, if you're paying for a good chunk of change on a 40-year-old Toyota, you wanna get a good one. These cars sit in a special place for a lot of people around the world. The subculture of the car, the price they demand, the build quality, and the purpose has now been concreted into chapters of history that sit collecting dust in the forums of decades past. And damn is it quite the car and adventure to jump into this platform. Simply learning about it teaches you just how much this platform means for some people around the world. In its infancy, the AE86 opened the doors for motorsport drifting and modification to those that otherwise never had the cash or real availability to get into it. Toyota opened that door for a lot of people. And this was the car that fed the addiction for drifting, for buying 240s, for creating the Miata, for understanding the purpose of the Lexus drift cars. It's responsible for fueling the passion that likely laid the main framework to the automotive culture in the 80s and into the 90s from a JDM reliability and ultimately not super damn expensive car that you and me could get into. And it deserves every ounce of respect, but it is damn expensive. VIN 619 Corolla SR5s on 15 by eight work equips are insane. They're like 1600 bucks. Again, there's another one in the gallery that's running TE37 and Yokohama Advans with BC coilovers, which can be quite the bill. And when you're already spending $20,000 on the car, the parts that go along with it are usually just as expensive. Sure, more affordable options exist, but the car has the iconic mentality it does. So no one really wants to go cheap on them anymore. It's really only the best of the best. Stormtrooper 86 has a beautiful setup on Workmeisters and the classic Panda two-tone setup that I just want. $20,000 for an A86 may be a little steep, but I'll take it. But that's the thing. To a lot of people, the car is a want. Once the price point comes into play compared to what you can buy for the same to price, the decision to pull the trigger can become quite a bit tough for people like you and people like me. Because $20,000 can get you an M3, boy. It can get you, dare I say, a Corvette, an S2000, even a Cayman. It's a high demanding price that stood for something in the 80s, but you're buying the principle. But the car these days, even though the platform is incredible, aren't being purchased 
for what they can do because many cars can do exactly what that car can do now. They're being built and bought for the foundational principle of what they once stood for. And you need to be sure that you understand that because while that's pretty damn cool, it can either leave you overwhelmed or underwhelmed. But what do you think of the AE86? Worth it or not? Let us know below. And if you're looking for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension, be sure to hit us up over at fitmentindustries.com. I'm Alex from Fitment Industries, not figment, not fiddlement, not filament, fitment. People at SEMA, the models kept saying it wrong in the videos. We will see you later. Goodbye.